Welcome to the Hughes Hubbard Anti-Corruption and Internal Investigation Practice Group's podcast, All Things Investigations. The Hughes Hubbard Anti-Corruption and Internal Investigation Practices Group represents many of the premier companies around the world, providing advice on issues spanning the full anti-corruption and compliance spectrum. In this podcast, host Tom Fox and Members of the Hughes Hubbard Anti-Corruption and Internal Practice Group will highlight some of the key legal issues involved in white collar and other investigations, both domestically and internationally. We will tackle topical issues involved in investigations, as well as explore how companies can prevent and detect issues that arise in conducting investigations on a worldwide basis. Hello, everyone. This is Tom Fox back again with another episode of the award-winning All Things Investigations. Today, I'm absolutely thrilled to have the domestic bound and domestic sitting Mike Hunicky. Mike, first of all, welcome back to the pod. Thanks, Tom. It's good to be back in the pod and good to be back in the United States. So, Mike, we had a major announcement from the Department of Justice in the form of the 2024 update to the evaluation of corporate compliance programs. And I think we both saw a lot of substantive information that compliance professionals can utilize and really need now to utilize going forward. And I thought it might be fun to maybe talk about Mike's top five and the top five things you and your colleagues are counseling clients on. So with that sort of introduction, let's just go through them and whether you want to do them in an order of importance or just one, two, three, four, five, that's fine. So where do you want to start? Tom, let's start with some of the things that are new. So if you take the new guidance or the revised guidance and just do attract changes against the most recent guidance, there are several things that to me really stuck out as important that might change how compliance teams today are thinking about risk and how they're managing it. The first thing that jumped out to me is that there's a lot of new text in here about risk assessments. Risk assessments are hugely important. In the United States, at least, and from a U.S. perspective, say, compared to some places in Europe, the good news is that the DOJ is still giving companies a lot of discretion about how they assess risk. But there is a lot of then weight put on your ability to describe that process to the DOJ and defend it if they may have seen some gaps. And certainly if you're speaking to them in the context where something bad has already happened, To me, the main thing about risk assessments that has been added is really this emphasis on emerging risks. And we see it also with an emphasis on emerging technologies. It's not enough just to say, what are my risks today? Or even what have been my most recent risks? But what risks do I see just around the corner? What process am I applying to look for those around the corner? There may be some companies and some industries where they take a look around the corner and there's not much there. But I think for most industries today, Tom, there's going to be all kinds of things around the corner. The guidance talks a lot about artificial intelligence and even has a whole section about that at the end, about how to, what criteria they'll look at in evaluating those programs. But I think it's also getting at the idea that are there some things that weren't regulatory risks for you? that now may be regulatory risks. Then the main thing that jumps to mind, Tom, is if you talk about national security issues like export controls and economic sanctions, I think for a lot of companies that weren't really on the front lines of these issues, they weren't selling U.S. munitions that would be regulated by the ITAR, the dual-use items they might have been selling weren't really that exciting. Now, as the export control and sanctions enforcement mechanism is gearing up. And we think they're certainly priming the engine on that. But as the U.S. government continues to look to those areas of law as tools of national security, for some companies, those may be things that are emerging risks, even if there's nothing kind of new about the fact that there are export controls. So it's very much fact and circumstance specific and from your perspective. Mike, you and I have had the opportunity to visit on several podcasts where we've talked about a wide variety of legal and regulatory risks. Uh, One of the takeaways I took from the 2024 update was that regulators in the form of the Department of Justice seem to be moving towards a more holistic view of risk and asking 
both companies and more specifically compliance officers to start considering a wider category of risks. Would that be a fair assessment of the 2024 update, or do you think maybe the DOJ is trying to communicate something else around these various categories of risk? I think it would be a fair characterization, and maybe the latter part of what you said is also true. The challenge for compliance teams is that that if you don't have a seat at the table, if legal doesn't have a seat on the executive committee, for example, or if compliance doesn't, it's going to be very hard to anticipate what your future business objectives are and what future or emerging risks those might bring along with them. This is another kind of point along the road of DOJ saying compliance and legal need to have a seat at the table. And this is another reason why they need to do so. One of the other specifically added texts in this guidance is a question that prosecutors are supposed to ask when they're evaluating any company's program. Is the program proactive or reactive? It's the same kind of theme as what we were just talking about and raises some of the same challenges. It's hard to be proactive if you don't know what are the future strategic objectives, what are the future deals that your company's going to pursue, buying or selling in order to reach those objectives. You can only help your company as much as you know what is about to happen. All right. What's next up for you, Mike? So number two on Mike's list, Tom, is uh, M&A, which is a topic we've discussed before several times, I think, and is an area where there's a lot of attention because of the safe harbor from a few falls ago that DOJ announced and slightly modified from the famous Halliburton opinion procedure release that you and I both know, I think, by heart probably at this point. In the context of M&A, the emphasis in the new guidance is on whether the new entity is being quickly rolled into your enterprise risk management system. So I think it's, in a way, it reminds me, Tom, of 20 plus years ago when kind of whether or not you had a code of ethics was an on or off switch, and it was great if you had it. Here, I think a lot of companies in the past have assumed, okay, we need to say that we're going to integrate a target entity into our plan and we're going to do, but that there's a little bit more gray zone around, well, what exactly do we have to commit to doing by when? With maybe the cloud of the safe harbor policy above your head, if you think there may be criminal conduct in the target entity that you've acquired. This is being a little more specific. They will want to know answers. In my experience, and I'm sure yours too, Tom, that This puts an emphasis on documenting what you're doing. It doesn't mean that you have to do anything specifically or by a specific time, but if you're going to get questions, and again, it's going to be questions that come up two years, three years, five years later, if something bad is uncovered, it's always great to have a document, even if it was a living document, even if it was a draft, even if it changed, but just saying, okay, we are are acquiring target company X. Here's some of the challenges we see. Here's our time frame. Here's our progress tracker for integrating that entity, not just into our compliance program now, but into the broader enterprise risk management system. And if your compliance risk assessment process isn't already integrated into your enterprise risk management system, there's kind of an assumption in here that it should be. So that's another thing for companies to keep in mind and to plan for. Mike, do you see, and I know we're going to get to data, access to data and using data, hopefully it's one of your separate points, but do you see an increased emphasis on the compliance use of data in the M&A context as well? Absolutely. And I think you may see a difference in practice if you're talking about what is actually and truly an asset purchase compared to maybe a stock purchase, but that kind of acts like an asset purchase are you getting the emails? Are you getting whatever electronic data the target might have? In some cases, you might just be truly buying only an assembly line or just a particular business unit, and you're not going to bring over the headquarters functions or the headquarters data. And there's a surviving kind of entity related to the target post-transaction that you can't control. You're going to have limited access to data in that space. But where practically or technically, whatever it may be, If you're getting the data when you bring it over, I think this puts an emphasis on making sure that not only are you integrating the going forward behaviors of the target into your compliance program, 
but that you're integrating that data into your program too, and that you can access it. I wouldn't be surprised anybody who's ever done an acquisition that suddenly post-closing, you learn a little bit more about how the target has gone to market that you may have wished you had known or that they had told you before closing. The emphasis here in this aspect of the guidance is when are you accessing and can you access that data that may have existed pre-acquisition so that you can accurately evaluate the risk of whatever you may be looking at post-close. What's up for point number three or on Mike's list? For point three, why don't we jump to data since it came up, Tom, what we were just discussing. Throughout this guidance, there are there's a lot of new information about data and types of data. There's references to emerging technology with a real emphasis on artificial intelligence and an emphasis on, okay, if you're using AI-driven tools, or maybe let's even say maybe that's more of a large language model tool that's being marketed to you as an AI tool, but whatever it might be, the DOJ wants to know in evaluating your compliance program, what are the inputs? Who is policing the inputs? Who is monitoring the tool's evolution, whether it's truly generative AI or whether it's just leveraging huge data sets more efficiently, but then still narrowing. It's a real message to anyone who's going to come in and cooperate with the DOJ that you need to read this guidance carefully, really front to back, before you're going to present to the DOJ cooperation. It's based on AI or large language model tools. There's certainly a lot out of there, out there, excuse me, that is good. Uh, increasingly helpful in doing investigations in an efficient way. And the more that DOJ embraces that, the better it is for everybody, frankly, because that's really the test of any of these tools. Can I go to the DOJ and get a resolution, maybe declination, maybe not, but at least a resolution of an investigation where I'm using AI and large language models rather than thousands of contract attorneys, for example, to go through the data? There's a bit of a roadmap there that people should be following. One thing that struck me also in this space about data, Tom, is there's a specific addition of language. How is the company using available data to monitor vendors in real time during the course of their engagement? And so vendors in this context is a reference to agents, consultants, really any type of third party, at least as I read it. This puts a big emphasis on what are you doing in the middle of that relationship with your sales consultants, with your sales intermediaries, channel partners, whatever you might call them? I think a lot of companies are very sophisticated in the onboarding process, using risk-based approaches and for the higher risk third parties, doing much more prob probative reviews, interviews, talking to the sales team, challenging the business justification. And I think at the back end, when it comes up to contract renewal, there's a similar risk-based process at many companies. In the middle, it's really challenging. You may not have mechanisms that exist currently within your data management systems to automatically ping your third parties for, hey, you owed us an activity report this quarter. We haven't gotten it yet. Those are the types of data points, though, that now the DOJ is going to specifically ask you for. It means that it would be worth uh, the time and effort, particularly for companies who have the infrastructure to support this, to really automate the demands for activity reports, particularly for sales intermediaries, those people who are really bringing you to the customer, bringing the opportunity to you. What they're doing, what they say that they're doing are critical data points during the course of relationship to make sure that what was presented to compliance and to management at the beginning of the relationship is actually what's happening. And if you have stratified levels of risk for third parties, like I think most people do, you want to make sure that someone that was presented to you, for example, as a true economic distributor in the classical sense, where they take on inventory, they take on risk, is that really how they're acting in real life? And if it looks like they actually aren't taking any risk, and they're really just acting as a sales intermediary, the sooner you know that, and maybe it doesn't require much additional due diligence, but the sooner you know that and can rectify the imbalance between their actual activities and the due diligence you did, the better. Mike, the thing that struck me about data is I looked at it almost as a macro-micro, and the macro was that it 
for once and all time told compliance officers, ye shall have access to the data in your organization. Not it's a nice to have, or not the CCO must, the compliance function has. But also in the micro sense, exactly what you just said, and it specified data to be used in areas that made intuitive sense, but perhaps the DOJ had never specified before. So they talked about data around culture and data around engagement and how can you demonstrate where you are, where you've been, where you're going, and did you get there? And I'd never really seen that specificity. It seems that the DOJ wants data to document all of these areas, and whether you break it down as a hallmark of an effective compliance program, that format, or some other framework, I think the data-driven nature of compliance is going to become much more critical now. What are your thoughts on that? Totally agree, Tom. They make a big point of saying, does compliance have access to the same quality of tools and tools with the same level of efficacy as, say, does your sales team? And so if, whether it's anti-corruption compliance, whether it's export controls, due diligence and compliance, if there's some group within compliance that's still using, for example, a native Excel spreadsheet shared on, you know, SharePoint, OneDrive, whatever it may be, but you have a Cadillac sales tracker using your sales teams using Salesforce and it's super easy and everything's being tracked. At least the question will be put to you. Why does the compliance team still have what today might be the equivalent of cave drawings when other parts of your business clearly receive the investment and support for tools that would work much better at sharing information across board? And, and really that's a, it's good of them to advise that because when you're sitting in a situation where compliance doesn't have the same data that the sales team has, not only can compliance not do its job, but under U.S. law, Tom, the, there's a collective knowledge doctrine. So the prosecutors are going to attribute to the organization the collective knowledge of sales and compliance, which puts everyone in a really dangerous spot if compliance doesn't have the same information or at least access to the same information that sales does. It's a, I think it's a critical aspect there that they want that on engagement. You're absolutely right to point that out as well. I think this is going to be a real challenge for people. I think if you look at trainings, for example, it's already been a bit difficult to track. It's easy to track who registers for the training. You want people then to sign something or it needs some kind of verifiable way to track that they actually attended the training. And now if you read the guidance that there, you may also be asked, well, how engaged were people in the training? Can you imagine, Tom, in this world of video conferencing and remote work, does that mean you need to have everyone with their screen on? What if somebody's screen goes off? What if it comes off and nobody's sitting in the chair? Now, they might still be listening. It might not be fair. But what I hope this comes to, <clears throat> assuming it's never, it's not, there's no chance that it goes away, is that there's some emphasis now on polling questions um, something that attracts people. I know if you're an accountant, for example, it's even more strict than for lawyers about continuing education. And if you don't answer questions at a certain point, or if you don't just click the mouse to show that you're still alive, or at least that your finger's still working at periodic points, you don't get credit for the course. And maybe we're, so the tools are there and maybe that's where, that's just, that's the add-on that has to happen now. But for companies that have spent a lot of time and effort just trying to build systems and controls around the delivery of the training and the registration for the training, they may need to go back now and say, how can we both encourage and then track engagement? And I think it's going to be a real challenge. All right. What, what do you have next, Mike? <clears throat> the next on my top five, Tom, and I think we're at number four, falls under the category is what does the program work in practice, which I think has been a very good addition in general if you talk about the years that have passed since this real focus has been made on, okay, design, great. We expect you to design a good program, but how is it working in practice? And this expectation helps compliance professionals to get the buy-in and support for management to actually like, deploy the program. So it's really important. What's new I, in the guidance that just came, or the, sorry, the most recent updates to the guidance, Tom, is that Prosecutors are supposed to ask you whether there's a track record of preventing or detecting other instances of misconduct. So this can raise some 
uh, interesting questions, and it's I don't think it tilts the scale decisively on the on considering whether or not to make a voluntary disclosure, but it should at least be part of that discussion now. What it does for me is reinforce the idea that if you're not going to voluntarily disclose this conduct, you absolutely have to have a strong record of what happened, what did you do about it, what root causes did you identify, and how are you certain or reasonably certain that the you fixed those root causes. This is going to require prosecutors to at least ask you those questions. And if you're dealing with something where, again, let's say export controls is kind of the new FCPA, so, so to speak, if there's been diversion through, say, somewhere in Asia to Russia, and it gets caught by the, the U.S. government and they ask you about it, they will ask you, okay, did you have prior instances of this that you at least were able to detect or, or prevent? And then the next question is going to be like, okay, what'd you do about it? They're not just going to stop at this question. And then if you did nothing about it, and then this new thing happened where they then became aware of it, you're going to be in a very difficult place to defend the overall efficacy of your program, at least in that aspect. Like perhaps this might be a sort of ending question, but it just struck me now. So I'm going to bring it up at this point. The text of this document, the 2024 update, really suggests to me an increased sophistication by the Department of Justice lawyers. Now, obviously, they sit across the table from people like yourself who represent clients who may be under investigation and are putting forward best practice compliance programs. But these questions, and they are questions as formatted in each ev evaluation of corporate compliance programs, show that the government is not just saying, show us what you did. They're really drilling down. And with, where do you think of the sophistication of what the government's asking us tells us about literally the sophistication of these prosecutors? I've always thought, Tom, they're highly sophisticated, just so there's no <laughs> doubt there. But I, to me, and I hadn't thought about it the way you put it, but I think you're absolutely right, Tom. And in that sense, it feels like it's still echoes of what we saw a few years ago with several DPAs being declared to be in breach second settlements with some of those companies involved that I think that there's probably still a view in the DOJ that they were too lenient in the past. And certainly in this administration, it's still in place and it may continue, it may not. But I think whatever happens in November, there's clearly, to my view, we got a little bit burned view in the DOJ. And this is a bit, this sophistication and drilling down is informed by experience. In a way, they're doing what they're asking companies to do. It feels like they've done their own assessment of lessons learned in dealing with companies in the past and where looking back on it, they feel like they didn't really get to the root causes of the issues or didn't really sufficiently ensure that there wouldn't be recidivism. Now they feel like they have to spell out these questions in more and more detail. All right. What do you have on number five for Mike's top five? Yeah, Number five, Tom, it's not a new change to the guidelines, but I think it has new significance given what we're seeing, given what we're seeing geopolitically. And that is the emphasis on lessons learned. And so the guidance says, does the company have a process for tracking and incorporating into its periodic risk assessment lessons learned either from the company's own experience or from the prior issues other companies operating in the same industry or geographical region have. And I've paraphrased it a little bit, so it's not exactly a direct quote. But from an FCPA perspective, this is old hat. We know for years that we've suppo we're supposed to look at the enforcement actions against other companies. We're supposed to look at specifically what did other companies admit was types of or topologies of problematic conduct. And even though it's a bit of prosecutorial common law because it's not in the statute and it's companies who are settling instead of engaging in an adversarial process, at least at that point, <laughs> no longer, that are admitting to these things, it is the guidepost. And it is what we tell clients, look, from the prosecutor's perspective, this is what they think. And whether they open an investigation, how they evaluate your company, what kind of resolution they might think is appropriate for you is all going to be driven by those past settlements. So you have to 
read the tea leaves, so to speak, and you have to read guidance like this. One of the things I've been thinking about and writing about a lot recently is the high probability standard, which to my view in the FCPA world really drives all of this. And it's why this stuff matters. And in a way, the government puts you on high probability awareness when they issue guidance or when they reach settlements in which they list basically guidance of here are the red flags that indicate corruption. Where we're seeing that now today is in the export controls enforcement area, which the DOJ has said is the new FCPA. And it's not just rhetoric, Tom. It's the export administration regulations also contain that high probability alternative definition of knowledge. And what have they been doing? Over the last two years, they've been issuing guidance after guidance. They even have bullet points where they replace the bullets with little red flags. They've had red flags guidance in this space for a while, but after the Russian further invasion of Ukraine in February 2022, they have issued several very specific guidance documents related to different types of risks, different industries, different actors. Now that they're going to start enforcing export controls diversion with this high probability standard, and we saw the first settlement just in August, where they went out of their way to reiterate over and over again this standard, they're going to look back to all of these things too. And so if companies receive inquiries or even an administrative subpoena from the Bureau of Industry and Security within the Commerce Department, they're coming, they being the Department of Commerce, is coming to the table with all of this in their minds informing their views about what were red flags and what to do about them. So companies need to adopt the same practices there. But it it struck me as a good reminder that today, this evaluation of corporate compliance programs guidance document is issued by the Department of Justice. It's not just the fraud section. This is not just an FCPA issue anymore. It's for really any issue companies might face where they may end up across the table from the DOJ. Mike, over the years, we've seen FCPA enforcement actions occur when a a compliance officer or GC reads an enforcement action of a competitor and wonders, do I need to look into that at our company? And and that's actually noted sometimes in the resolution documents. How would you suggest a compliance professional or a CCO formalize that process within a company? Should there be documentation of that if the regulators come knocking and should they assign that to a a junior lawyer to go and search cases? How might you suggest a formalization of that process? Tom, you can't do that for all purposes, right? You'd run out of time and resources very quickly. In my view, once companies have done a risk assessment and they've identified what really are their greatest risk areas, particularly of corporate enforcement, for those risks areas, they need to find some solution to this. For smaller companies, maybe it's as much as subscribing to newsletters, subscribing to law firm client alerts is useful or not to some of those maybe i don't want to oversell that ours are great of course but i know people can get quickly inundated with things like that but really having someone on your team interested in the subject matter tasked with the responsibility to keep abreast of current developments in areas where the doj or the department of commerce or others are actively publishing guidance at the very least you need to track Uh, that guidance. All of those agencies today offer the ability to sign up to newsletters, uh, and they will gladly inform you when they've brought the latest enforcement actions. Even then, I do find, Tom, that whether it's DOJ, Department of Commerce, Department of State, sometimes the press releases and the settlement documents themselves aren't as direct and clear for this purpose as they otherwise might be. Now, they're trying to serve a lot of different purposes with these things. And the headline from a deterrence effect may not necessarily be the headline from a compliance lessons learned effect. Sometimes you really have to dig down into the underlying documents to see where did things really go wrong? What was the scheme? What was the problem? That takes a little bit of effort. And whether it's internal resources or external resources, you may not be able to look at every case, but things that are in your industry involving companies that you consider to be your peers are worth looking at carefully. Even right now, again, to take export controls as an example, where a lot of the enforcement activity is against individual middlemen, your kind of arms broker who happens to also have made the mistake of traveling to Brooklyn, even buried within those, you can find nuggets 
that if you were a company, what would you want to know from this? For example, one shipment was blocked and the second one went to a Tandoori restaurant. You kind of want to know if you had some reason to look, take a second look at a transaction, you now ah, it's going to look really bad if I don't Google Maps this address and see if it looks like a real business or not. And if it looks like somebody's mom's house or a food joint, yeah, you'll be glad you caught that in advance. Mike, I'm going to end this podcast by asking you for either a final thought, thoughts, or, or sum up, but I'm going to start and give you a minute to collect your ideas. And I just want to emphasize the evolution of the Department of Justice, certainly the evaluation of corporate compliance program, which was initially released in 2017, but we had the FCPA resource guide in 2012. We had it updated in 2020. I think we're now in the sixth update fifth or sixth update to the evaluation of corporate compliance programs. We have a pilot program around clawbacks and holdbacks. We have a DOJ whistleblower financial program and incentive program. And I just want people to, to really understand compliance evolves, the regulators evolve, and we must re evolve in response to regulatory requirements, regulatory guidance, and risks on the ground. Frankly, Mike, that's why I find this to be one of the most exciting and challenging areas for law or compliance is the ever-evolving changes, and the regulators tell us their expectations, so at least we have that. So with that, I'll ask you for your final thought or thoughts. It's really extraordinary, Tom. How many areas of law does the prosecution issue reams of guidance and advice in settlement documents in a very open way like this. I mean, I keep thinking back to what I read in some of the legislative history of the FCPA. I think in the early 1980s, there was an SEC commissioner who was asked, well, should the government be required to issue guidance about the FCPA because companies find it difficult to understand what I think at the time was the reason to know standard for third party payments. And the commissioner's like, this is ridiculous. We don't tell people how to commit murders. And so if you take the view that all this guidance is, you know, helps companies get away with misconduct, then you might feel that way. But that's a totally unfair way to look at this. I think this is an interesting echo more than 20 years later of Enron and really of the collapse of Arthur Anderson, where the government continues to be very hesitant to put corporations and employees and shareholders at risk unless they really have to. And I think they feel like they're bending over backwards here in these areas of law where they're issuing this type of guidance. Caution to the people who ignore it because the government thinks it's doing you a big favor. And in many ways they are. But if you come in or get caught and you've just totally blown this off, or if you think that the right approach is to be combative and to reject uh, the relevance to the government of this guidance, you're going to be in a very difficult spot. So it's, it's pretty extraordinary if you think about it, Tom, that we get this level of detail and this level of guidance from our government before they prosecute anybody. Mike, that seems like a great way to end this podcast. I wanted to thank you again. I've really been looking forward to this. I appreciate you taking the time to visit with me, and I greatly look forward to continuing our conversations. Always a pleasure, Tom. This is Tom Fox again. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of the award-winning All Things Investigations. If you've enjoyed this episode, I hope you'll subscribe, rate, and review wherever great podcasts are listened to. All Things Investigation is a production of the Compliance Podcast Network.